Hello and welcome to the Qubit Guy podcast brought to you by Classic, the quantum algorithm design company. My name is Yuval and my guest today is Ian Mason, a business and technology analyst. Ian and I discuss several topics, including what are the key concerns that quantum customers express? Do customers sometimes fall into an all or nothing trap for quantum? As well as several others. We hope you enjoy this episode. Please let us know how we did by emailing hello at classic.io that's hello at C-L-A-S-S-I-Q dot I-O. Hello, Ian. Thanks for joining me today. Thank you, Yuval. It's great to be here. So who are you and what do you do? Well, I am a tech strategist and uh, program advisor in the artificial intelligence and uh, quantum space, especially the area where uh, those kind of capabilities are cloud enabled. Um, but I'm also a content developer, so I help uh, enterprises and organizations articulate their best thinking and lead industry conversations and so on through films and infographics and animations and that sort of content. Uh, and probably not surprisingly, on the side, I'm also a photographer and filmmaker uh, and a writer as well. Amazing. I mean, you're like the Michelangelo of quantum, I see. He was better as an artist. <laughs> He was better than most, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so how did you get into quantum? That's a good question. I started um, about a year ago to look into cloud uh, computing for the first time, in fact. Uh, so that was part of a turn in my career back to technology uh, after Gap, where I'd focused mainly on, on strategy and, and content development. And... Uh, after cloud, that led me to artificial intelligence and machine learning. And the focus on cloud and AI, I think, caused me to simply trip over the IBM Kiskit, you know, cloud-enabled uh, quantum offering. And I immediately thought, wow, this is a huge change that um, what I had thought quantum to be, which was, of course, gigantic machines that only scientists can touch. Uh, an experiment with was suddenly being offered to all of us on the same model that uh, Amazon and, and Google and so on are offering their compute services. Uh, so I thought that was really quite remarkable I, and I began to dig into it and uh, and then the science behind it started interesting me as well and, and uh, on I went. So you help organizations today with their quantum strategy. How do you how do you assist enterprises and actually what kind of companies do you work with? Well, this is really a new offering for me. Uh, so it's, uh, a, let's call it a, a perspective offering in the sense that other larger consulting firms like Accenture, for example, have quantum offerings that when you look at it are essentially uh, feasibility studies or conceptual, um, you know, and answering the question for a large enterprise, could this work for us once quantum reaches the right scale and, and the right level of uh, the, you know, the reduction of noisiness and the, the increase in reliability? So could this work for us? Now, I don't plan to help JP Morgan with this sort of thing. My offering is always focused on smaller to midsize uh, businesses, but I think there are a lot of them out there that uh, are probably starting to hear about quantum, starting to think about how it might affect them uh, or what kind of an opportunity it may create for them in terms of uh, optimization, let's say, or how it might play into the artificial intelligence work that they're already uh, um, using right now in their, in their operations or you know, with their customer facing uh, capabilities. So I think that's really the, the space I'd look at, which is um, you know, how, does, how could quantum help and if it's going to help how should we prepare for that day? Because I think the, the interesting thing about the quantum industry right now, or one of its one of many interesting things is that it's uh, the, the, the predictability of it is not as straight line as it sometimes seems when you draw it out on a map and say, you know, as IBM does, we're going to try and double the number of qubits or, or the, the amount of quantum volume, let's say uh, every single year it's not necessarily that straight line. And everyone knows that because serendipity comes into it. And I think that uh, companies worry in the back of their minds that it's possible that even though the roadmap, the current roadmap may say, oh, this might be 10 years away or this might be 20 years away. Um, what if it's three years away? What if somebody comes up with something that they were not expecting and they're not ready for that? And suddenly their competitor is doing quantum 
and solving problems that they can't solve uh, because their competitor was more optimistic about it than they were. So I think that's really where uh, quantum consulting comes into play. So you work with companies primarily in the formation stages, you know, they're thinking maybe they should do quantum uh, or do you work with them also once they put up a small quantum team to try to explore the opportunities? Right. It'd, it'd be more the second. So not so much a quantum startup per se, who of course has already decided that that's their space, uh, but much more an operating enterprise, uh, you know, perhaps a, you know, mid-size um, manufacturing firm or something like that, or a mining firm or somebody, you know, concerned with logistics. And they're already using perhaps machine learning. They're getting into internet of things. They're starting to digitize all their operations. And they're also wondering, because they've heard about it, does this mean we should also get into quantum two years from now or five years from now? And it's that question that I want to be able to answer for them. So is that the key concern? I mean, for instance, do people worry whether quantum is going to be at all useful for them or have they answered that? Is, is the question more about how soon or in what area? I mean, what sort of are the key concerns that you're hearing? Yeah, I think um, one of the most common questions is simply, will this be useful at all? Um, there are two sets of business people out there when it comes to quantum. There are uh, fully um, drunk the Kool-Aid, true believers uh, that think it's going to be completely transformative and we have to move as fast as possible to uh, be ready to adopt it into our business operations. And the second set who have kind of barely heard of it, you know, they certainly know about quantum physics for sure, but they, they haven't really heard of quantum computing, don't really realize that it's available over the cloud as a, at least as an experimental tool, um, and haven't answered the question yet of if this is going to be possible, A, is it going to be possible? And B, will it help us in particular? And if so, how? Because of course the jury is uh, still a little bit out, right? I mean, we can we can run the math and the theorists have done that. They've run the math and looked far ahead and said, if we can build X, Y, and Z, then this should give us a huge advantage in this set of problems. Um, and that's truly amazing. Hopefully that all comes true. But then the question is, does this set of problems apply to a given business? Um, and if so, how? And then how long did, you know, is it a waiting game for them or is it more of a, uh, let's start to get prepared, let's train some people on quantum, let's run some uh, uh, you know, hypothetical studies to say, if it does work the way we expect, what kind of a competitive advantage does that give us? Um, and therefore, what's the value in it for us? What are the table stakes um, or the, the, uh, the size of prize, as we would say, um, that we should pursue? And that allows them to level their investment into it. You know, do we build a big team? Do we just hire one person? Do we, do we send our CTO off to do a quantum course just so they're aware of more or less how it works? Um, these are all choices that businesses have to make. Do you feel that customers sometimes fall into sort of an all or nothing trap where it's either quantum supremacy or nothing at all? Uh, I saw this interesting piece of research from Hyperion, I think, that says, hey, companies... If you can give us 5x, 10x, 20x performance improvement, that's wonderful. Even if we could hire or rent a supercomputer, a classical supercomputer that would give us the same performance. How do you see that? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I think that uh, certainly at the level of making investment decisions in new technology, there because there's such a large perceived risk around new things like this, uh, and this, by investment, I even mean training up a team. You know, not, it's nothing like the level of investment of should we build our own quantum computer, uh, because very few companies are going to actually make that decision. Um, but even training up a team, because it's very new, you have to go quite high up the chain of command in order to get that uh, that sort of investment approved. Which means that the question starts to become simpler and simpler as it goes up the chain of command, from being a you know, at, at, let's say at the technical level, a highly nuanced question of is 5x enough or is it really 10x? And what if a high performing supercomputer could do it? Why are we really investing? These are all kind of, uh, you know, manager level, technology level questions. By the time it hits the board, 
where the CEO is saying to the board, this is why we're going to put this extra amount of money into our IT budget to work on quantum. It becomes a very simple decision. It's look how incredibly transformative quantum will be. Uh, that's the way that those sort of decisions are going to get sold. Um, so I think there is a tendency because quantum is brand new to force it into an either or bucket. But I think you're right that the there will be many, many business cases where the uh, the truth of the matter is that it's actually a much more subtle decision. Um, and in many cases, the, the answer may be let for now, let's just go with the supercomputer, the classical supercomputer. Um, but recognizing that three years from now, the quantum computer will probably be beating it. So we better also in parallel start preparing for that. At a high level, what kind of advice do you give companies? I, I assume good one, but <laughs> good <laughs> advice. But if you could be a little bit more specific. Uh, on that particular question? On, on, on general, on how to get started with quantum, on when to enter the market or what to ask themselves before they decide to launch a quantum team. Right. Well, I think, um, as I was saying earlier, the, those kind of core questions of understanding the hypothetical case of if quantum computing works as well as we all hope it does, will those um, situations where it's particularly good and better than what classical computing can give you, how will those situations apply to our business? Um, I would also tell uh, a CTO, for example, that even if it doesn't apply to your business the way your business is currently configured, you should also ask yourself, how might quantum help you to change your business? Does it open the door to a different kind of capability or a different kind of offering? Um, because that, that technology now exists, uh, you know, again, hypothetically, a few years from now, um, uh, versus all the assumptions that are baked into what you do and how you operate today, which is all based around the maximum capabilities of classical computers. So it isn't as simple a question as, as simply saying, given what we do today, will quantum help? It should also be, given what quantum can do, does that mean we should change our strategy or change what we offer? Um, especially in, in a competitive analysis of what everyone else is doing in your space. If no one else is jumping on that and taking advantage of it, you might have an opportunity to do something quite differently given what quantum, um, given its unique capabilities. To what extent do you feel that companies are fixated on the hardware capabilities, number of qubits or quantum volume? And do they think about software? Do they ignore it? Do you think software is important to look at or just hardware or, or just software? Uh, and, and that became its own um, self-fulfilling prophecy. Although I, you know, I should be careful about that language because of course the effort that went into every doubling of the number of transistor, transistors really reflected a lot of engineering work and engineering talent and often new approaches to stuff those transistors, to shrink those transistors and get them to fit on the chip with each new generation. But that quantitative um, exponential scaling down of, of transistor size in the classical computing space has trained all of us, including enterprise clients, uh, to think about computing at that kind of countable level. And I think quantum computing, because it's starting from zero, it's sort of going the other way, right? It's actually starting not from um, a macro perspective and then shrinking down, it's actually starting from a micro or nano perspective and then scaling itself up. Uh, but that too becomes a, a, a game of counting. And of course, there are, are vastly um, uh, many other factors that go into the power of a quantum computing system rather than just simply its qubits. Uh, so I think the, the industry is going to be hopefully changing its language. Uh, you can see signs that it's starting to with, with the notions like quantum volume that um, IBM at least is talking about a lot. Um, and, and that'll lead us to a much more holistic way of thinking about why is this particular quantum computing system more powerful than this other one? What are all the factors that go into it? And that leads you to much better you know, requirements definition and things like that, because you're not just saying, oh, I need a 72 qubit system. You've got a, a, a more complicated, nuanced, fully shaped idea of why do you need this system? How does it need to interface with the classical computers you're running? What kind of software do you need to be uh, both interacting with it and also for the, the kind of software that's actually running the system itself. 
uh, and the compilation software and between those two things, how do all those work together as a system? And I think we're, we're starting to see those conversations um, and that kind of language begin in the industry, but it, it's only just beginning. And by the way, you mentioned 72 qubit systems. One question that comes up is how do you know that you need 72 qubits? I mean, you need something that takes your algorithm or what you're trying to do and estimates how many qubits are necessary. And maybe it's not just about qubit numbers to constraint. Maybe you worry about accuracy. Maybe you worry about the depth of the circuit or, or you're trying to fit into a particular hardware. So I, I certainly agree with you. Um, as we come towards the end of our conversation today, what do you think companies like Classic could do with regards to educating the market on what's the right thing to do? Yeah, I think um, education broadly, of course, is a, an incredibly important thing for the quantum computing industry. Uh, again, it is coming out of its um, very nascent, you know, just got invented yesterday kind of stage. Um, and of course, that's highly dependent on theoretical physics, um, computational science, uh, a lot of PhD level stuff, um, which is quite abstruse to regular people, even to other computing professionals who are used to the world of classical computing. Uh, and so I think, um, you know, companies like yours, the more that they can uh, explain um, both accurately, because we don't want to uh, oversimplify the operations of quantum computing. We don't want to oversimplify uh, the logic of how it creates quantum advantage or quantum supremacy. Um, because frankly, even for me that, and I'm you know a few months into learning intensively about quantum computing, um, that logic of where exactly does it generate, what elements of it are the things that generate its quantum advantage in theory. Um, have taken a while to, to come clear for me. I think that even that kind of language is oversimplified in how it reaches the, the general press and how it reaches um, business people. Uh, so I think finding that, um, th that level of language that is both accurate, but also uh, can lead uh, business people and classical computing technologists through the learning path uh, two key insights that you're trying to get across to them so that they see it as being logical. They don't feel too much has been left out. They don't feel like they're being talked down to. Um, but at the same time, the, we haven't accelerated out of sight uh, after the third chapter and whatever we're trying to tell them you know, into um, linear algebra and complex numbers and so on, all of which is, has been a temptation for the industry because that's where the magic is happening. And, and most people in the industry have naturally tended to need to talk at that level amongst themselves. But we need a new language for talking to everyone else just outside the industry or just entering the industry now. That's excellent, Ian. So how can people connect with you to learn more about the work that you do? Well, probably the easiest way is to visit my website, which is hassardfay.com, H-A-S-S-A-R-D-F-A-Y, all one word, dot com. Uh, and you'll find my service offerings and my bio and also a link to my LinkedIn profile. And you can always connect with me there. Perfect. Well, thanks very much for joining me today. Thanks, you all.